Number 29 Hanbury Street was the scene of the murder of Annie Chapman, the second of the canonical five victims of Jack the Ripper. Her horrifically mutilated body was found in the backyard of the house at 6am on Saturday the 8th of September, 1888. Hanbury Street itself was a long thoroughfare that stretched from Commercial Street to Baker's Row, off which was located White's Row, leading into Buck's Row, where the murder of Mary Nichols had taken place just a week before. Number 29 Hanbury Street was a three-storey dwelling that had been built around 1740 for the Huguenot silk weavers, and, like many of the dwellings in the vicinity, it possessed an attic or garret which would have been used as a workroom by the weavers, but which by 1888, like the rooms on the other floors of the house, was being rented out as accommodation. Conditions inside must have been, to say the least, somewhat cramped, given that 17 people lived in the building. The landlady, although not the owner at the time of the murder, was Mrs. Amelia Richardson, who had been there for 15 years. She occupied the front room on the first floor, and shared it with her 14-year-old grandson, Thomas. Mrs. Richardson ran a packing case business from the cellar of the premises, the entrance to which was located immediately to the right of the steps from the back door into the yard. Directly across the yard from the back door was a shed in which she kept the wood for her business. She employed her son, John Richardson, though he didn't live on the premises with her, and on market days he would supplement his earnings with casual work in nearby Spitalfields Market. The yard was completely enclosed by fencing, and was separated from number 27 to the left of the back door by a close wooden fence about 5 foot 6 inches in height, the timber of which was old and rotten. A similar fence separated the yard from that of number 31 to the right. Between the steps from the house and the left fence, there was a small recess, two or three feet wide, which was obscured from view when the back door was open. On the far right of the yard, there was a closet or toilet that was used by all the occupants of the house. Describing her tenants in the aftermath of the murder, Mrs Richardson had this to say. My lodgers are poor but hard-working people. Some have lodged with me for twelve years. They mostly work at the fish market or the Spitalfields market. Some of the car men in the fish market go out to work as early as 1am, while others go out at 4 or 5am, so that the place is open all night and anyone can get in. The ground floor front room of the house was rented by Mrs Harriet Hardiman, who was described by the East London Observer as a medium-sized, well-proportioned woman with a very pale face and a curiously rounded chin. She shared the room with her 16-year-old son, William. As well as living there, she also ran a cat's meat shop from the room, and her son would go out hawking their products around the streets of the neighbourhood. Amelia Richardson used the ground-floor back parlour as a kitchen, and being a religious woman, she also held weekly prayer meetings there. The rear room on the first floor was occupied by James Waker, a tennis boots maker, and his 27-year-old son, Alfred, who was described by Mrs Richardson as being weak-minded and inoffensive. Their room, so the newspapers later reported, had an uninterrupted view of all the yard below. Mr Robert Thompson, who worked as a carman for Goodson's on Brick Lane, rented the front room on the second floor and shared it with his wife and their adopted daughter whilst two unmarried sisters named Copsley, both of whom were employed in a cigar factory, were the tenants of the rear room on the second floor. Sarah Wilcox, an elderly woman whom Mrs Richardson allowed to live rent-free out of charity, occupied the top or attic back room. Two weeks before the murder, new tenants had moved into the front attic room. The father, who worked as a carman at Leadenhall Market, was 56-year-old John Davis, and he and his wife Mary, who was 50, shared the room with their three sons, James, aged 23, Benjamin, aged 20, and David, who was 18. On the night of Friday the 7th of September, John Davis retired to bed at 8 o'clock, and his wife Mary followed him about half an hour later. Their sons turned in for the night at different times, the last one at about a quarter to eleven. Mrs Richardson, having held one of her prayer meetings, locked the back parlour door and went up to her room, retiring to bed at half past nine, whilst the Copsley sisters, who stayed up talking with two young men in the passage until half past twelve, were the last occupants to retire. 
as they drifted off to sleep that Friday night, none of the residents would have envisaged that within twenty-four hours their humble, overcrowded abode would have become infamous throughout the land. Mrs. Richardson was a light sleeper, and she later stated that she had been very wakeful half the night. She was awake at 3 a.m., after which she had only dozed. She heard Robert Thompson leave for work at just before 4 a.m. and called good morning to him as he came down the stairs. He headed out into the street without going into the yard. At around 4.45 a.m., John Richardson arrived at the house to check that all was well with his mother's workplace. A few months earlier, the cellar had been broken into and two saws and two hammers had been stolen. He therefore made it a habit to drop by and check that it was secure before he went to work on market mornings. When he arrived, the front door was closed, so he lifted the latch, pushed it open, and walked through the passage to the back door, which he opened as it too was closed. He didn't go into the yard, as he could see from the top step that the padlock was securely fastened on the cellar door. One of his boots was causing him discomfort, and so he sat down on the second step, and using a rusty little handless table knife, he trimmed a bit of leather from his boot. He then tied his lace, popped the knife back in his pocket, and made his way to the front door, leaving the back door to close itself. He was certain that he shut the front door as he left. His visit to the house was a brief one, lasting around three minutes, and although it was not quite light, he later stated that he believed there had been enough light for him to have seen a body had one been lying there. So if John Richardson was correct about his timings and actions, then the murder had almost certainly not been committed at 4.45 a.m. At 5.15 a.m., Albert Kadosh, a carpenter who lived next door, went to the rear of the yard of number 27 to use the communal privy. Making his way back to the house, he heard two people talking in the yard of number 29 on the other side of the fence. He couldn't distinguish what was being said, but he did hear the word, No. He went back into the house, but a few minutes later had to go out again, and this time he heard a sort of fall against the other side of the fence dividing number 27 from number 29. He did not look over the fence to see what it was, as he thought it might be the neighbours at work. He then set off to work, and passing Spitalfields Church, he looked up at the clock and saw that it was 5.32. Meanwhile, at 5.30, Mrs Elizabeth Long was walking along Hanbury Street from Brick Lane on her way to Spitalfields Market, where she worked as a cartminder. She distinctly heard the clock on the brewery in Brick Lane strike 5.30 a.m., making her certain about the time at which she had been in Hanbury Street. As she passed number 29, she saw a man and a woman talking together on the pavement outside, standing against the shutters. The man had his back to her, so Mrs. Long didn't see his face, but the woman was facing her, and later, when shown the body of Annie Chapman at the mortuary, she was adamant that she was the woman she had seen. The couple were talking loudly, and she heard the man say, Will you? To which the woman replied, Yes. However, since there was nothing about them to make her suspicious, she walked past them and continued on her way to Spitalfields Market. Of course, there is a discrepancy between the two aforementioned accounts, as if Albert Kadosh did hear Annie Chapman with her killer in the backyard of number 29 before he left for work, then Elizabeth Long couldn't have seen them in the street at the front of the house at 5.30am. At the inquest into Annie Chapman's death, the coroner, Wynne Edwin Baxter, explained the discrepancy by observing that Kadosh had been mistaken about the time, but that is for another video. Up in the front attic room of number 29, John Davis had woken up at 3am, and unable to go back to sleep, he lay awake until 5am, at which hour he dozed off, until roused again by the clock of Christchurch Spitalfields, striking a quarter to six. He and his wife Mary got up, and his wife made him a cup of tea, which he drank. Mary later recalled that as the church clock struck six, her husband said to her, Old woman, I must go down, for it is time I was off to work. So saying, he left the room and headed down the stairs, intending to use the backyard toilet before setting off. Testifying at the inquest into Annie Chapman's death, he recalled what happened next. On the ground floor there is a front door leading into a passage which runs right through to the backyard. There is a back door to this passage. Sometimes both doors are open during the night and I have never known either of them to be locked. 
Anyone who knows where the latch of the front door is can open it and pass along into the yard. I cannot say whether the back door was latched on Saturday morning when I got down, but the front door was wide open and thrown back against the wall. I was not surprised at that. The back door was shut, and opening it I found the body of a woman lying in the recess between the steps and the fence. Her head was towards the house, and her feet were towards the woodshed, and her clothes were up to her groin. What was lying beside her I cannot describe. It was part of her body. I did not examine the woman. I was too frightened at the dreadful sight. Racing through the passage and out into the street, Davis called to three men standing nearby. Men, come here. Here's a sight. A woman must have been murdered. The four of them made their way through the passage of number 29, and looking down from the back door, saw an horrific sight. One of them, John Henry Holland, actually went into the yard, although he was later adamant that he hadn't touched the body. A few minutes later, they hurried off to raise the alarm and fetch the police. Mrs. Richardson heard the commotion from her first floor front room, and sent her grandson Thomas to find out what the matter was. He returned and said, Oh, mother, there is a woman murdered. She later recounted that, I went down and saw the deceased in the yard. There was no one in the yard at the time, but there were people in the passage. I noticed that the door to the back parlour was still locked. Mary Davis also heard the tumult and came down to investigate. I nearly fainted away at what I saw. The poor woman's throat was cut and the inside of her body was lying beside her. Someone besides me then remarked when the murder was just like the one committed in Butt's throat. The other one could not have been such a dreadful sight as this, for the poor woman found this morning was quite ripped open. She was lying in the corner of the yard on her back with her legs drawn up. It was just in such a spot that no one could see from the outside, for most of the dead creature might have been lying there for some time. In the front ground floor room, Harriet Hardiman had slept very soundly all night, but she was woken by a frightful din coming from the passage. Fearing that there might be a fire, she sent her son to see what was going on. He came back, she later recalled, and said, Mother, don't upset yourself. It is not a fire. It is a woman that has been killed in the yard. I did not go out, she continued. I often heard people go through the passage into the yard. Standing in the passage looking down at the body, Amelia Richardson was certain that she recognised the woman. When I saw the murdered body, I, I, I was so shocked. I, I, I did not like to look, particularly at her face but I have no doubt it is the dark woman that used to come round with cotton and crochet work, and I have bought off her many times when she has said she has been hard up. She used to come round to these houses, and other neighbours used to buy off her too, and lend her money when she said she had not enough for her lodgings. The first police inspector on the scene was Inspector Chandler, who arrived at 6.20am. A crowd had gathered outside, and the passage was full of people, albeit none of them had gone into the yard. Chandler immediately sent for the divisional police surgeon, Dr. George Baxter Phillips, and then ordered his officers to clear the bystanders from the passage. He covered the body with some sacking and then awaited the doctor's arrival. I won't go into a great deal of detail about the doctor's findings, but it is worth noting that he was certain that Annie Chapman had entered the yard alive and had been murdered where her body was found. As for the time of death, Phillips was of the opinion that she had been dead for two hours, probably more, when he first examined the body, albeit he later added the caveat that it was a fairly cold morning and the body would probably have cooled more rapidly because of the amount of blood loss. John Richardson would later state that it had been known for years that parties out of the street came and used the passage, landing and stairs for sleeping and other purposes and also that they used to go through to the back. He had, he said, seen plenty of strangers there, both men and women, at all hours, and had turned them out. Asked if they went there for immoral purposes, he replied, Yes, I have caught them in the act. As Dark Annie had been in the habit of coming so often to the house, he later told a reporter, he had no doubt in his own mind that she was well acquainted with the place. Mrs. Richardson, by contrast, was adamant that the premises were not used for immoral purposes. As Lloyd's Weekly newspaper reported, She is naturally greatly shocked that such a terrible crime should have been committed there. As her rooms are used for prayer meetings once a week, both she and the landlord are very angry at anything like a slur on the respectability of the house. 
Throughout the Saturday and the Sunday, Hanbury Street became something of a tourist attraction as people from all over London flocked there to get a view of the scene of the murder. According to the St. James's Gazette on Monday the 10th of September, There is still great excitement in the East End of London. All day yesterday there was a large crowd before the house in Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, at the rear of which the body of the murdered woman, Annie Chapman, alias Sivy, was found on Saturday morning, and to the neighbours on either side did much business by making a small charge to persons who were willing to pay it, to view from their windows the yard in which the murder was committed. In the street, half a dozen customers took up their stand and did a brisk business in fruit and refreshments. Thousands of respectably dressed persons visited the scene, and occasionally the road became so crowded that the constables had to clear it. That night, Hanbury Street was all but impassable from the crowds who had assembled. However, not all the neighbours were attempting to cash in on their sudden notoriety. Indeed, some of them were truly disturbed by what had happened. One of these was Mrs Elizabeth Bell, a resident at number 31 Hanbury Street. Lloyd's Weekly newspaper, on Sunday the 9th of September, reported that Mrs Bell, an old lady who lives next door, sleeps by an open window, not ten feet from the spot at which the murder took place, and is certain that no noise was made, as she sleeps very lightly. Mrs Bell stated that I have been living here some time, and I wish I had never come. Such a terrible sight is enough to shock any woman, with the hardest heart. The house is open all night next door, and this poor creature was taken into the yard and butchered, no doubt, by the same man who committed the others. We were all roused at six o'clock this morning by Adam Osborne calling out, For God's sake, get up! Here's a woman murdered! We all got up and huddled on our clothes, and on going into the yard saw the poor creature lying by the steps in the next yard, with her clothes torn and her body gashed in a dreadful manner. I cannot be sure if anybody in the house knew of the murder or took part in it, but I believe not. The passage is open all night, and anyone can get in, and no doubt that is what happened. All the other tenants of the house gave the same opinion, the report concluded, and those in the house of Mrs Richardson at number 29, where the murder occurred, state that they heard no cries of murder or help, nor anything unusual during the night. The murder of Annie Chapman seems to have convinced the householders in the neighbourhood to become a little more security conscious, as, according to the Dundee Courier, on Friday the 14th of September, most of the street doors in Hanbury Street and the neighbourhood, heretofore left on the latch all night, have now been fitted with locks and the lodgers supplied with keys. On Thursday the 20th of September, the Echo reported that a mysterious letter had been sent to Mrs Hardiman, the tenant of the ground floor front room at number 29 Hanbury Street. Document of some importance. Inspector Helson, Inspector Aberline and Inspector Chandler are now busy making inquiries regarding a letter received this morning by Mrs Hardiman, proprietor of the cat's meat business carried on at number 29 Hanbury Street. The police themselves naturally decline to give any information whatever respecting this document, which is regarded as of some importance, especially as certain men are alluded to, and the writer, who resides in Mile End, desires his name to be kept a secret. The letter has more special reference to the crime in Bucks Row, for the writer positively asserts the poor woman was made tipsy, then murdered, and carried to the spot where she was found. Our reporter called upon Mrs. Hardiman, who assured him that she had received the letter in question. The source from which it came, she could not at present state. It would appear, though, that the police dismissed this missive as being of any importance to their inquiries, as no further mention of it was made. In the wake of the dear boss Jack the Ripper letter being made public in early October, the Richardson family found themselves being targeted by one of the letter writers. The Sunderland Daily Echo on Wednesday the 3rd of October reported that It is somewhat curious that Mr Richardson, who lives at the house, 29 Hanbury Street, where Annie Chapman was found murdered, received yesterday morning a copy of Monday's Liverpool Daily Post with the letter and postcard referred to marked in blue pencil. The newspaper was wrapped in an ordinary stamped cover and was addressed to Jack the Ripper, 29 Hanbury Street, London, 
EC. The paper was posted in Liverpool on October the 1st, and the postmark is numbered 466. On the reverse side of the wrapper was written, Dear Jack, I send you this paper and hope you will come to Liverpool, as I am an associate of yours. KT. Please reply to 39 Pitt Street. Mrs. Richardson immediately handed the paper over to the police, with whom it remains. The Liverpool correspondent of the Central News paid a visit to 30 Pitt Street and reported that the premises was occupied by a very respectable smallware dealer who is a widow with four children. She has never had a lodger answering to the initials KT and is very much distressed. She cannot account for her address being chosen except that some malicious or foolish person has pitched at random upon her house. Thereafter, Newspaper reports on 29 Hanbury Street grew fewer and fewer as the curious crowds transferred their attention to the sites of the murders of Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Kelly. As for the residents, by the time of the 1891 census, the Richardsons, Hardymans and Davises remained in residence and the fact that the number of occupants had risen to 25 suggests that the murder in no way deterred prospective tenants. That the house still attracted curious sightseers is attested to by a court case that John Davis's son, James, found himself involved in in August 1891. The Yorkshire Evening Post published details of it in its edition of Thursday the 13th of August of that year. Jack the Ripper, Scaring Hysterical Women At the Worship Street Police Court, London, Robert Goodchild was summoned for assaulting James Davis. The prosecutor lives at 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields, in the backyard of which the third of the murders ascribed to Jack the Ripper was committed. He said that he was coming from the yard on the night of the third when he met two women, one of whom was the defendant's wife. They started screaming and ran away, and before he could get upstairs, the defendant rushed in and attacked him, striking him several blows. The defendant, who did not deny the facts, called one of the two women, who said that she, with the defendant's wife, entered the yard at night time to see the place where Jack the Ripper did the murder, and they saw Davis standing in the middle of the yard. They called out, Who is there? But Davis did not answer, and only moved towards them. They bolted, screaming that Jack the Ripper was after them. That brought up Mr. Goodchild, who struck Davis. Mr. Montague Williams, the magistrate, thought the assault arose in mistake and bound the defendant over to keep the peace. Sometime around 1895, the ground floor of number 29 was taken over by hairdresser Morris Modlin, who traded there until 1905, after which it was then let to Nathaniel Brill, also a hairdresser. A new second door was added, providing access to the front shop. The hairdresser ceased trading in 1957, and it is believed the ground floor was left unoccupied thereafter, although the N. Brill sign remained. Stuart Evans visited 29 Hanbury Street in 1967 and took these photographs of it, and that same year it featured in the documentary The London Nobody Knows, when actor James Mason paid it a visit and even ventured into the backyard to show viewers the site of the murder. This is the only record on film that we have of the site, albeit, sadly, since I do not own the copyright, I cannot show it here. However, if you do a search for James Mason, 29 Hanbury Street, you should be able to find excerpts that have not yet had copyright strikes against them and been taken down. The house continued to be occupied until 1970, in which year it was demolished, along with the entire north side of Hanbury Street, and an extension to the Truman Brewery was built on the site. And so yet another direct link with the Jack the Ripper crimes disappeared, and were any of those long-ago residents to return today, they would find their abode replaced by an unsightly light brown brick building. Every day hundreds of people make their way up and down Hanbury Street, few of them giving any thought as they pass this section of the wall that they are very close to the spot where on the morning of Saturday the 8th of September, 1888, Annie Chapman met her untimely end as Jack the Ripper claimed the life of his second victim. <laughs>